Ladies and gentlemen, this is a disclaimer that the content you are about to listen to could contain traumatic or emotional stories. If this brings up any emotions or traumatic events that you've experienced, please seek appropriate services if needed. As always, it is important that we remember that the guests are here to share with all of us, and we need to be empathetic and supportive to foster a community where individuals feel safe to share these types of stories. If you have an individual you would like to see on the show, please make sure to comment below, and I will see if they're interested. If you are someone interested in being on the show, please please reach out and let's make it happen. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome ladies and gentlemen to Deep Dives into the Minds of Esport. Today I am honored to have on my show someone who I consider a friend. He's not afraid to give his political opinions and he is an excellent shoutcaster who used to be involved with the European League Champion Series. Let me present Devin Young, maybe better known as Pyrotechnics. Welcome. Hey, uh, how's it going Blake? Thanks for having me on. You know that's the first time I've actually got that introduction right without messing up someone's name. You have to, you have to get it eventually, right? Yes, it has taken a very. So I'm really excited. I'm really excited to get into this. This is a, a little bit more casual. We have lots of stuff to talk about. Um, some of it's going to be easy. Some of it's probably going to be a little bit more difficult. Um, but I'm going to start you off with some like easy get to know you uh, type of stuff because I don't think people have gotten to see the background of kind of like your life and who you are and where you come from and where you grew up. I know that there's a little bit out there, but I don't think people ever really get that picture of what makes you, you. Okay. So would you just want to want me to like give a little bit of like about myself, my background or. Nope. nope I'm, I'm not, I'm not making it that easy for you. I found an old blog of yours. Actually, I found a couple. Old oh boy, here we go. Yeah, you weren't expecting this one. So the first one is the easy uh, you, one. Someone does enough of a Google and, and you'll, you'll find it buried in there, I'm sure. Oh yeah. So the first one is actually kind of cool. Um, it was a, a beer review vlog and we're not condoning any underage drinking. So if you are above the legal Man, I'm, age, I'm, 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 I'm 28. So, you know, I've, I've, I haven't heard, I haven't heard underage drinking for a well, long time. I will say that a lot of the esports people are under, I'm going to be 27. So oh, you're such a youngin. Oh, <laughs> I mean, I look 12, so I do have that going for me. Um, <laughs> you're going to enjoy that in a few years, man. Maybe. So I found a, a drear, dr beer drinking blog of yours. So are you a, a connoisseur of a lot of beers? Because I noticed some like microbreweries on there. stuff. So I'm not really a beer drinker myself, but you seem to kind of know what you're talking about there. Uh, so that was something I started back, I think it was like back in like 2011. So that would yeah. have been when I turned when I turned 21, actually. Um, and it was just, just sort of like a fun project. I always enjoyed writing. It's something I want to actually uh, do a lot more of now that I've left Riot. Uh, but I, I always just kind of like would comment on stuff that I was doing. And this is kind of what got me into commentary in the first place. But the initial uh, envisioning of this whole thing was, you know, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at a bar, like a craft brew place. I come from California. There's a lot of craft brew bars. Uh, and I would just write about whatever I was drinking, or if I found something in a store and I was like, Ooh, this is kind of new and interesting. I'd write about it. Just take notes and try to write up a couple paragraphs about it. Um, I could always pick that back up again, but I probably want to find a different platform for it. I think it was on like blogger or something. It's I don't like, even remember. There's so many things that I, yeah, I looked through so many yeah. different blogs of yours that there was, there was a lot there. I'm excited for it, the, the TV series, Netflix one that we'll get into later. Uh, oh God. <laughs> So uh, you obviously lived in, was it Berlin? I still live in Berlin. Yeah, yeah. that's correct. Um, so there's talks about lots of delicious beer there. Comparing California to Berlin, which one did you like better? Well, let me just start by saying this. Germany has fantastic beer. They're known for it, but they are not known for the variety. So in Germany, there's this, this, this little thing from like the 1400s they call the purity law, which is like a certain level of like ingredients and things that you can actually use in order to call something beer. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of constrained to a certain degree. So like a lot of the really experimental stuff in like, like these microbrew uh, concoctions, things that like it added, like orange peel and stuff like that, I don't think they would actually get to be called beer under, under that... Uh, under that old German law that's still on the books. They'd have to call them like a malt beverage or something. Don't quote me on that because I, I could be a little bit off, but that was always how it was explained to me. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they tend to be, a lot of the beers tend to be like, to me at least, a little samey. You've got like your Pilsners, which is like a little little like sour and bitter. It's really common around Berlin. In Munich, you have like these more like malty kind of cereal tasting ones, which are really, really nice. 
but uh, you get like a huge variety in the U S with like the whole microbrew trend that's been going on for years and years. So that's kind of like one of the big differences. So it's not as much variety, but it is plentiful and easy to get access to in, in Germany. So that is something to be said for that. Okay. Who would have thought we'd have been talking about beer starting off here. So you mentioned that you, you, you grew up in California. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and I know that you obviously, you went to school and you actually finished your degree, which I don't, for esports or people involved in esports, I'm not sure how, I mean, it's becoming more common now, I think, um, at mm -hmm. least based on like the Overwatch scene, but I don't know how common it is that people actually finish their, their four year and then end up moving into esports. A lot of times when you look at like the players and coaches, a lot of them don't actually have any school experience. I'm not sure about the caster side of it. Um, what was, uh, what was your degree in and what was, what made you want to go into that? So my schooling was kind of before I really even became aware of esports. I, I used to watch like StarCraft and stuff when I was in college, but that was about it. It was really when StarCraft II was kind of starting to take off. Uh, it had just launched in my sophomore year. Uh, so I actually majored in computer science. So I was surrounded by lots of nerds. Uh, and that made it really easy to get into things like gaming, like esports. That's actually how I discovered League of Legends. Uh, one of my classes I had, I had a project group with four other people. And they were... Uh, telling me about this game. He's like, oh, you got to try this game, League of Legends. Like, what is it? It's like, oh, it's like it's like uh, if you ever played Warcraft 3, it was like one of the custom games, and they'd, came, they'd made their own game out of it. So I gave it a try. I was like, oh, this is really fun. And then they made me play this new uh, exciting game mode called Dominion. And uh, that was I was really obsessed with that for about a month. Yeah, I know, rip. Um, but it was it was a cool it was a cool game, and it was it was so much fun. I almost uh, didn't I almost didn't get a passing grade in that class because I spent so much time playing it with them. Now, you seem like a very charismatic person. Um, yeah, obviously, you do shoutcasting, so that means that you kind of at least like to hear the sound of your own voice to a degree, uh, I hope. Maybe not when it's played back on Twitch. I get a little cringy at myself. But you seem like a charismatic person. Have you always been like that? Has that something that has always kind of been with you? Um, well, I don't I don't know necessarily about, about charisma, but I, I guess I've never been afraid to just kind of, like, start talking. Mm -hmm. uh, ever since I was really little, like, I used to be... I used to be like the really loud kid in class. I'd always be like raising my hand first, asking the questions. I always got on a lot of people's nerves because I just, I wouldn't shut up. Mm -hmm. um, like I, like my parents tell me about like all these times when I was like really little and I was in like the grocery stores just talking to strangers about random bullshit. And uh, it just, it, I guess it's just kind of always been who I am. I just, I just like to talk about stuff that interests me. And that's kind of where my passion for, for all of this stuff, like the blog, the, the just doing esports in general. I just like sharing what I'm interested in with people and, you know, learning and hopefully teaching at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, growing up and you were getting on kind of like your parents' nerves. What was growing up like for you? Did you have any brothers or sisters? No, I'm an only child. Um, probably made it easy to get all the attention I needed. So that was, uh, you know, the house was probably loud enough with just me. But uh, yeah, I always wondered what it was like, what it, what it would be like to have a sibling. But uh, that wasn't me. I, I had a sibling there, a pain in the butt. So we're just throwing <laughs> that out there. I'm I've, the heard, I've heard that too. I'm the older sibling. Oh, so that's, that's, why. that's how it goes. Yeah. So, okay. um, so you grew up, what area of California did you grow up in? So I, I was born up in, in the Bay, but when I was young, we moved down to San Diego. So I guess if I had to like say where I'm from, it's, it's pretty much SD. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that, that sort of whole like laid back vibe that that town has is, is something that I think really kind of like affected me growing up. Like it was always it was always like a part of my personality to try and like kind of go with the flow and, and see whatever you could do. I, I always kind of enjoy going back there because it, it's just relaxing, you know? Mm -hmm. I've actually never been to San Diego, I don't think, but I, would I recommend like it. I would, I would like to go. There's a lot of places I want to travel, like Europe is on the, the bucket list here soon. So growing up in S San Diego, what was uh, school like for you? Because you mentioned that you got on people's nerves sometimes. So what was uh, the, the school life like for you? You didn't have any brothers or sisters. So. Uh, yeah, actually, so it, it's kind of interesting. I, I went to public school for a while, mm -hmm. but I, I actually got bullied quite a lot and not like, like, you know, like physically bullied, but just like kids would just avoid me because I was the annoying kid in class who made all the noise and a lot of them didn't want to have anything to do with me. So when I was in middle school, my parents actually pulled me out of public school and put me into like a, like a, uh, it was like a private school, but mostly, mostly it was kind of like super intensive, like, like college prep study. Mm -hmm. for kids with like ADD and stuff like me. So I was around a lot of people who are really similar to me and it was a really small environment. I went from like, you know, like a big public school to like a, a place with like 30, 40 kids. So I got a lot of like unique attention and I'm, I'm really fortunate my parents made that move. 
uh, because I, I don't think I really would have developed a lot of the social skills I have if they hadn't done that. Mm -hmm. uh, what age did you end up moving to a more private school? I think I was like maybe 13 or 14. I, I can't remember exactly, but I was about the age. So it was like uh, fifth, sixth grade? Yeah, something like that. Okay. So up to fifth grade, what was uh, like the school like? Because you mentioned you kind of got bullied. Um, and I know that for me, uh, I went to a very, very small school. Um, and I got bullied a lot. And a lot of it was very derogatory statements. I got beat up a few times. Okay, more than a few times, but I got beat up. And you mentioned that you didn't get really beat up. But what was what was that effect on you? Because I remember for me, it caused me to to socially withdraw from my a lot of my scenarios. And I know different people handle it in different ways. Some people retaliate. My brother did that. Um, some people uh, kind of join the group and become the bullies. What was it like for you? Uh, I, I guess I guess the, the biggest thing I remember like struggling with was just trying to understand like why I had so much trouble making friends um, because that was always kind of like the big drive for me it was like I just want to share everything with everybody and when people don't really want to have anything to do with you it's kind of that's kind of like the psychological bullying so that was always my big struggle like I know I used to like I used to get like picked up from the schoolyard early and I'd be crying and stuff and my mom would try to figure out what was wrong because I didn't have any bruises on me or anything. The other aspect of, of, of it was that I, even if people wanted to wanted to like beat me up, I usually didn't get caught. I was pretty good at running. Um, that was like my, my one athletic claim to fame. Like I was never like a like an out of shape kid. I didn't like go out of my way to like be an athlete or do exercise or anything, but I was always fairly fast. So I was like I was just a weird kid that people, you know, they couldn't catch me, but they didn't necessarily want to have anything to do with me. Uh, until I, you know, got put in that that smaller environment where a lot of those kids they'd come from a similar background, you know, they didn't they didn't really care if I talked a lot because we all just kind of shouted over each other. It was like that. It's like that scene in Finding Nemo with all the seagulls. Everyone's just like, mine, 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 mine. That's kind of what it was like after fifth grade. So that was more fun by comparison. Okay, so you mentioned that you had um, uh, ADHD. Uh, mm -hmm. It was up. like diagnosed around the same time. Okay. Did when, you ever? Uh, when I got uh, put in the school. Did you ever get put on medication? Because I've worked with a lot of people who have been uh, on medication and it affects them in different ways. And some people struggle with that, and some people have it. Some people can actually manage without it, depending on their situation. Um, what was that like for you? Yeah, I took. Um, I think I took like Ritalin, Adderall, that kind of stuff for uh, about like a year. But I remember just not enjoying it. Like I could focus a lot better, mm -hmm. but I would have like trouble sleeping, and a lot of the creative side of like my personality kind of it just sort of seemed dull. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just eventually took myself off it when I felt like I could get along with my studies without it. Mm -hmm. And uh, my parents were really supportive there. So, you know, I mean, it was, it was probably good to trial, but yeah, I, I, I didn't really enjoy it that much. I don't like being out of my mind all the time. Yeah. I, I know that I suffer from ADHD and it's, it's weird because there's moments where you just go and you don't want to stop going and there's like different yeah. things. And the, like the creative process, I understand what you're saying there where you just, it's, it feels so good sometimes. Uh, it's very, very odd, but I, I understand that. Mine was never bad enough to where school is really uh, an issue. And when I socially, socially withdraw, that's what I kind of focused on with school. Um, so mm -hmm. it sounds like your parents were a staple platform for you. Like growing up, they sounded like they were very stable and helped you you get through all of your, your different schooling. And they, they were sounds like they were really willing to uh, kind of like help you out. What was What were they like? Like what? Who are they as people? Because we—that's who made you and who helped really raise you to be the person you kind of are. Yeah, I mean, I was really lucky. They—they they were, you know, not only like financially able to to put me through like all the schooling and and give me the things I needed, but they were also just really supportive. Uh, my parents are both really different people. Like my my dad is very like pragmatic. Like you know, if you've got a plan, he'll he'll support it. He just wants to know like the logic in it. Uh, my mom is much more like a go follow your dreams, do whatever you, you know, do whatever you want, be that creative person. So between the two of them, I think I like, I, I tried to pick up as many good traits as I could. So like when I, when I was getting into esports, my dad was kind of like, well, you know, I don't understand what this is, but it sounds like you have a plan, you know, like, you know, how far you can stretch like the money and the resources you've got and you know what your exit strategy is if it doesn't work out. And my mom was just kind of like encouraging me the whole way. So I think between them, I kind of, I kind of had this, this one, two punch of like being able to, to get things done. And I'm, you know, I'm like very, very fortunate to have that. Cause I know not everybody does. Mm -hmm. So growing up, they were very staple. They taught you all these, these different skills. Was there any sort of, uh, extracurricular activities that you kind of uh, fled to? You mentioned that you kind of liked gaming. I know for me, it was music growing up was really big for me. 
um, mm-hmm. like going through high school, what, what were those things that kind of you attached to, the things that you really enjoyed? Well, in terms of like like classes and things that I would take outside of school, uh, one thing I really enjoyed doing when I was growing up, I was I was kind of a, a big like Japanophile, so I would you know I was obviously really big on anime and stuff for a while. Um, but I actually took I don't know if you're familiar with like the 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 fencing martial art kendo. Um, I, I did that for like four or five years. Yeah, it's it's with like the bamboo swords and the 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 head armor and everything mm-hmm. and the wraps. It was really cool because it's 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 fairly big on ceremony, but there's a lot of like. A lot of like practical exercise application it was something that kept me active i made some friends through it learned a lot i, I it's one of the big regrets that i haven't actually kept up with it uh since i had moved away from from san diego they just never really followed it up um outside of that other active things i did I, I snowboarded a little bit it's weird i know i'm from san diego and the one board sport you can't do there is the one i do uh but never like you know this was always more like a dabbling thing it was just like oh this is fun i'll do it with friends for the most part I get enjoyment out of doing things with other people mm-hmm. so I can do just about anything. And that's, that's probably what drew me to esports in the first place. Cause the entire drive was to share it with people around you. You don't do it really in solitary, like even Twitch chat, like you feel like you're part of something, even if the something is just lots of random spam and rhyming emotes. Looking at like Twitch chat, it obviously has its, uh, its pluses and its minuses. Um, I don't understand memes, so sorry, people. Uh, it's my like downfall in life. Oh, uh, we can, we can, we can, we can teach you. We Everyone teach says you. that, and they have not been successful. We'll see. Um, so not looking, yet. looking, looking at that, you have to deal with a lot of people. How do you handle the the negativity in your life? Because there's probably so you mean like publicly or yeah, yeah. There's public humility or uh, public negativity. Um, how do you, how do you handle that? Because obviously you you like sharing yourself so much, but sharing yourself like that always comes at some sort of cost because you're you're putting yourself out there to the world. So what's that? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd say it's it's a learning process. Like you you're always making yourself vulnerable by putting yourself on a stage, and it, part of the territory is realizing that not everybody will like what you present. Uh, you know, like there's there's a difference between like people not liking what you do and genuinely messing up and making a mistake and where the way you handle that is like very different when it comes to just people who don't like what you do. Um, or they just not a big fan of your presentation style. Like, you know, at some point you just got to kind of take it in stride. Uh, it definitely took me some time to kind of brush off negative comments. Like Twitch chat's one thing, Twitch chat just kind of spams so fast. It's kind of hard to like, it's kind of hard to like, you know, take a lot of it seriously like i think what a lot of casters do and i know especially a lot of us uh, at the european lcs office would would do for a long time is you know we'd always scroll post game match threads on reddit and like you know hope for the best obviously like if nobody said anything about us then that was probably a win um but you know you're gonna get negativity sometimes and, and i've definitely had a handful of instances where i was like not expecting the amount of flame and it's you know you, you kind of have to take a step back and just realize well look people didn't like this you can always learn from it whether or not you actually did anything wrong is a whole other story uh and that leads me into the whole like you know what happens when you actually do mess up because you will like everybody everybody makes a mistake you might get a call wrong or like an end end of the game might be like just not very energetic or or maybe you drop a, a an f-bomb or something uh like uh, certain certain casters uh cough deficio uh, have done it multiple times of course sometimes that adds to your brand sometimes people like it um yeah i think it's really at the end of the day whenever something happens that gets a reaction you weren't expecting it's always good to reflect on it and and you know think like well you know could i have done something different this is in this but also to accept that okay well people people didn't like this today but you know just keep on chugging and don't worry about it and for the most part that's kind of the way i've been able to react to any negative press i've gotten and i've been fortunate that i haven't had a lot of it so that's good do you remember the first time that you did have it? Do you remember like the moment or the exact place you were in? Because I, I imagine that would be something that would be fairly substantial, like the first time that you put yourself out there and you're like, wow. Yeah, like like serious flame. I think I think the biggest one I can remember um, was like a couple years ago. And I was casting with stress, and there was a remake of a game um, with Giants, and it was like it was one of those games. I think it was like Giants Vitality, like way back when. And I think it was a situation where one team was very clearly winning in the public's eyes. And it was like, you know, probably closer than it looked. But at the same time, the, the ruling had been made to remake the game. This was pre-chrono break. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of a tough situation. 
And it was one of those games that would have determined playoffs versus relegation zone. And if I remember correctly, I said something to the effect of like, oh yeah, you know, Giants need to pull like a Taylor Swift and shake it off or something. And it rang really callous with a lot of people. They were like, oh, you know, he's just a riot shill. He's just, he's just towing the company line. People were ready to like explode at somebody. And I just happened to be the easiest target. And I remember like, oh God, we sat in like meetings and stuff and like went over it. Personally, I think the internal discussion was probably a little more than needed to be, but it was, it was just a shock to me that, that people had taken that so negatively. And it just, it taught me that, Hey, you know, sometimes you got to be really, really measured with the way you make statements. Even if you have the best of intentions, if it doesn't come across that way, people are going to be upset. And uh, yeah, it, it was, it was a good learning experience for the most part. So when you had that that feeling, did it remind you of being a kid a little bit? Because I know that I've had moments where it's so bad. I'm like, wow, this is just like being like a kid again. And I feel like an outsider and I feel like I'm pushed away from everyone. Did you did it bring back those feelings uh, of your childhood? Was it similar? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know if it's like if it really felt like being a kid. It, it's for somebody who really wants people to enjoy what I do. Mm-hmm. It definitely hurt from that aspect. And, you know, if that's, if that's similar to like being a kid and looking for approval, I guess you could say that, but that's not really how I interpret it in the okay. moment. Okay. So we talk about, uh, we have stress. You obviously have released some, some big news today. Um, and I do yeah. want to get to that. That is something that we are, and it's, it's funny you mentioned stress because I know stress also, uh, ended up leaving the, yeah. uh, EU, ULCS. Um, so we're, we're going to dive into that cause that's something I'm really looking forward to. Okay, but we're, we're going to save that for people to watch later on. Looking at going into, like, college, what made you decide the career path that you wanted to go on? Well, a lot of it was up in the air. I think um, for a while, the the primary goal I had was to kind of work in the games industry. And originally, I wanted to be, like, a developer or a designer. And I didn't really know how to go about it. I know I didn't want to get into, like, specifically, like, a game design school because... I wanted a more general rounded education. So I went for computer science because I thought, Hey, look, this seems to be the most direct route I can find at like a regular university. And if I don't like it, I can always switch out of it. It's always easier to get out of engineering than into it. Mm -hmm. So I I thought that that was the most straightforward career path. Um, you know, my priorities kind of changed over the years. I wasn't hundred percent sure what I wanted to do, but I enjoyed learning what I was learning. So I just kind of stuck with the program and, you know, I ended up with a degree. Okay. So you end up finishing school. And then you and uh, you go you leave school and you ended up working for a company called ResMed, right? Yeah, you've done your research. As back in San Diego, it was the first uh, first job offer I got. It seemed like a good uh, opportunity at the time. Okay, so did you pick that offer because it was back home? Uh, let me let me put this down. I'm starting yeah. to, starting to get a little muscle fatigue there. Here we it's go. Okay. Um, yeah, I decided to go with um, ResMed uh, partially because it was you know it was an offer that I received pretty quickly after graduating. Um, I was considering, I was living in Colorado at the time. I was thinking about getting job, a job back there. Um, but I missed California a little bit and I thought, you know, what the hell I can see my mom a little bit more and, and make this stuff kind of work. So I got the job back there and I just sort of stuck with it for a little while. And, uh, it was a good first experience for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Being out in the, you know, the real world, if you will. Yeah. So does your dad not live in San Diego then? No, he lives out in, in Colorado, actually. So he moved really similar, really close to the same time I actually went out to school there um, for unrelated reasons, but it just kind of lined up nicely. Okay. So are your uh, parents still together or are they separated then? No, they've, they've been they've been apart since about the time I was going to college. Okay. Um, what yeah. was that like for you that moment? Because you said it was when you went to college. My parents split up when I was six. And I, I remember normally uh, people who tend to be younger, it's a lot more traumatic. What was that like for you? I think I was much better equipped for it when they did finally get separated. I, I you know, I learned later that it kind of like a while in coming, but they'd sort of wanted to stay together for me. And, you know, again, it's another really supportive thing. Um, but uh, I was much better equipped to deal with it than if, if I had been younger, it was still weird. Cause you know, you, you kind of grow up and you think, Oh, your parents are like Superman, right? Like they can do anything and like, there's, there's no, there's no limit. And then when you find out that they're actually, you know, human, then, you know, it, it, it can shatter some, some perceptions you have it's it's not necessarily like an entirely negative thing but it it is definitely like a shock and you have to kind of learn how to react to it 
Mm -hmm. And so when that happened for you, because I know a lot of people, divorce is actually very common nowadays. I actually, when I see someone who's been together for like 60, 70 years, I'm always kind of surprised because it's, it's more of an abnormal now than it is for a norm. Um, how did you handle it? Because I know a lot of people struggle with uh, handling those types of situations. Um, yeah, I guess, I think for the most part, I just kind of like, I just kind of like kept thinking in my head, all right, well, my parents are getting divorced. So I'm going to have to like, logistically, how do I, you know, how do I handle that? How do I deal with like seeing them both at different times? And, um, I think my reaction mentally for the most part was kind of like, well, I guess this is, this is when I have to grow up. This is when I stop being a kid. This is when I become an adult, you know, you're, you're kind of late on in teenage years anyway. So, uh, yeah, that was that was kind of like my biggest like thought at the time. I didn't really know how else to process it. Okay. And then over the years, you probably came to process it more, and it doesn't sound like it was too, too traumatic for you, and you still have a good relationship with both of them, it sounds like? Yeah, yeah, for the most part. It's really easy to, to get along with my folks. I just, I just have to, you know, make sure I'm, I'm calling one and then the other because I can't call them both at the same time. So yeah, has a little extra been, time spent. Has it been hard for you being away from your family living in – Europe for the last, it's been four years now, right? Yeah, just about. Uh, it'll be four years in January. I think I've always been able to kind of pick up and, and, and move places, but it is hard to kind of leave behind something you're used to. And when it comes to like my parents or like my friends in California, Colorado, wherever, it's it's hard because you have to make an effort to start keeping touch. Every time you move, you know, I can think anyone experiences that kind of thing. But when you're across like multiple time zones, it definitely gets a little more difficult. Uh, and you feel a little isolated at times. Like I know when I first moved to, to Germany, it was weird because maybe I spoke a little bit of language, uh, but I didn't really know anybody outside my coworkers. It took several years before I started making friends outside of the office. And that is a big adjustment, like making, making a change that huge definitely takes some time. So sometimes I wonder if I never really got used to it at all. Like I still get like weird culture shock when I'm like, I'm trying to talk to this person, but I don't know what to say because I don't know the word for something that I need to talk to them about. Yeah. So, I, yeah, definitely takes a lot of getting used to. So you, you must have felt very isolated a lot of times when you were living in Europe then. Yeah, I mean, outside the office, I think I think what I did for a lot of the time was I really doubled down on getting to know the people I was working with, which was really fortunate because a lot of them had come from all over the place, um, you know, all over Europe. But there were, we had Americans in the office, Canadians as well and, and people from all over the place so it was kind of nice to share that sort of same feeling of like uprooting and making a big change uh, at the same time that the Berlin office was really just starting to be put together um and you know it was, it was definitely good for that for a while once I kind of started moving outside that bubble and making friends outside of it it was you know I think I was kind of ready to but it was a it was definitely a really supportive environment to kick things off so you start working at Riot, uh, you come from working doing the LPL inside of your your own little tiny room, uh, working with Frost Gear and, and uh, Kelsey Moser. And so you end up going over to Riot, they pick you up. What was it like when you first got to Riot? Uh, I mean, it was it was insane. I, I felt like uh, I felt like I was a kid on Christmas, to be honest. I, I had just like finished up uh, doing like some part-time work that I'd been doing on the side to make a little extra money. I uh, had like, I had just sort of like, like cuddled like the plane tickets and everything sorted. And when I got there, it's like the middle of winter. It's like frozen, snowy. I'm, I'm a California yeah. boy, by the way. So like, I'm just like, Oh my God, snow, this is amazing. Um, and, and it's just like, everything is so different. And, and I get put up in like this hotel and I just look outside and it like looks all dreary and everything, but I'm just like, I can't stop being excited. So I'm just like, I don't know where I am. I don't know what's going on. I don't even know where the office is, but I'm going to go in. And I think I just like randomly like walked in like the day that I arrived, like super jet lagged, like tried to shake everybody's hand. I'm sure it was really annoying and irritating and fanboying out all the time, but uh, it was, it, I was, I think I was giddy for like three days straight at least. So you look at joining Riot, and then you look at, you obviously finished your degree and you, you worked in ResMed. What was the, 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 the life like for ResMed compared to working at Riot? Because you, when you first went into ResMed, it was probably, you were probably happy, but I don't think it was anywhere near to the ecstatic level of probably getting a job at Riot. So what, what were the <laughs> well, two different work environments like? 
So it was really nice to get a job period. I'll just leave that yeah. there. Um, but the work environment at ResMed was, it was just more, much more corporate. Um, and not to say that Riot isn't corporate. Uh, it was a lot less when I joined, at least from the Berlin office perspective. But ResMed was, uh, you know, I was in a, in, a, in a department doing software that wasn't a software company. So like we were kind of like off on our own and the median age was a lot older. You know, I was one of the younger guys there. Um, and while I enjoyed doing what I was doing, I wasn't quite as driven as some of the other people, uh, because it was just, to me, it just kind of felt like a job. A lot of people were really focused on like climbing up the ladder and making, uh, making a lot more like happen for themselves and, and kind of, uh, like going above and beyond on like certain projects. But I really, really did that on things that interested me. And I think that's, that's definitely one of the things that has been a problem for me that I'm not really cut out for like a very corporate environment because I can only motivate myself when it's something that really piques my interest, when it's something that's really cool. Like I got to work on this uh, project doing uh, like an encryption algorithm and I love doing that. And I worked like around the clock on that. But when it came down to like just mundane normal stuff like solving a bit of problem that was annoying but wasn't really fun to deal with you know i kind of struggled a little bit and i think i think uh, that held me back at that job and the fact that i just wasn't really interested in, in you know playing playing the political game like the company mixers and stuff were fun but i never really talked to like influential people and things like that it just wasn't really for me so you know like it, it wasn't a huge shock when i got like a bad performance review and i was kind of like well i guess people just don't really like me and that was kind of a big indicator that it just, that sort of line of work wasn't really cut out for me. Um, that was about when the time when I, when I started thinking like, well, you know, what does make me happy because I'm clearly not happy here. And I was spending like all my time watching esports, like Starcraft league of legends, you know, back in 2012. So I just delved into that and had this harebrained scheme to start doing content. And I guess if you work hard enough at it, it works out. Yeah, I can fully, I actually, when I, it was probably like my third year of college, I was like, I'm going to get into esports. I don't know how I'm going to get into esports, but I'm going to work every single day to figure out a way to get it in. And I, I fully agree that you need luck, but you need to put yourself in the right situations. You can create the luck and, yeah. and not to say that like everyone will make it right. Yeah. Like I, I don't want to say like, oh yeah, you know, it's, it's easy. Just do it. It requires a lot of hard work, but if you keep, I firmly believe if you keep hacking on something, and you have even the smallest shred of ability to do what you're doing, you will make it somewhere. It just depends on where and when, and you know, putting yourself in the right place and waiting for the right time is definitely the best strategy I can see. Yeah, I would fully agree with that. So you start to work at Riot. When you first got there and started working, what was it like there? So it felt a lot like a startup. Um, as somebody who'd kind of you know, done little stints here and there with startup teams, uh, the Berlin office was brand new. We had just moved over from Cologne. So a lot of people that had previously worked with us were ESL. Uh, so we had a lot of new people on the ground. It was a much smaller team. The, the shoutcasters, it was pretty much Pulse and Stress, myself, Quick Shot, Deficio, Shocks. That was it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Pulse and Stress were mostly doing Challenger at the time. So like the ULCS team was down to only three broadcasters uh, for, the, for the time being. So it was all hands on deck for a while. Um, we occupied like a really small office space, like on a much a higher floor than the one we currently are in. It was like the same building, but like a, a different part of that office. And a lot of, a lot of the stuff was still being helped out through North America. Like we had the broadcast team. A lot of them were back in Los Angeles and producing it through Los Angeles, uh, while we were getting ourselves off the ground. Um, it, it was just, it was just so much more like if you need something like walk across the hall, ask somebody this, like there wasn't like a, Oh, fire off an email or oh, get on, get on Slack and do that. It was, it was so much more like person to person, which is cool, but there's also a lot less processes. So things tend to like go back and forth and there's a lot of like high energy and it definitely could be a lot more stressful than like a very measured environment that is uh, much more similar to the one that I was working in until recently. So I guess overall, I, I think I enjoyed that environment more because I like to, I kind of thrive a lot in the uncertainty. I don't really like processes so much, but uh, it was very different to how ResMed operated. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot less people like looking over my shoulder, for instance, that and there wasn't anybody who could do that. Uh, so that was a big win. And just the fact that, you know, two days a week, I was doing the best thing ever. And the rest of the days I was planning to do the best thing ever uh, was kind of enough to kind of push me to just push myself every day. Mm -hmm. 
So one of the things that I've seen with people in esports is you start working and then it's it functionally becomes your life when it when you start to get involved and that becomes a primary kind of like motivation. It's a lot of times the only thing that people think about. Um, was that the case for you, or were you able to branch out and still accomplish some of those hobbies? Because you mentioned leaving kendo, and you, uh, I imagine that there is snowboarding there, but did, I, it doesn't sound like you probably snowboarded a lot, um, if at all. Uh, did you did you focus wholeheartedly on just your work? I did for a long time, actually. I think for the first couple of years, um, I was at I was at Riot. Most of everything I did involved around League of Legends or revolved around League of Legends. I, I was playing quite a lot, tryharding. I'm obviously like really bad. I'm like a silver scrub, um, although I had peaked at like gold or something before I went over. So I played a lot of League. I, I, I did a ton of research. I really wanted to impress and I really wanted to kind of prove that I was worthy of stepping into the, the big shoes that like Joe and, and, and D-Man had left behind. Um, I think I really didn't do, I didn't have as many hobbies apart from just like playing a uh, league and a few other games prior to that either. Like I'd spent most of the year that I was, that I was sort of training myself doing more or less the same thing. Um, but uh, I didn't really have a lot of hobbies outside of it. No. So for a while there, it really was just kind of like gung ho on league of legends. And uh, you know, as a result, I, I pushed myself and this is, this is why I got, I got, the opportunity to do worlds a couple times. I uh, managed to get myself onto the MSI desk and you know, it was, it was really good. That was, that was probably my best year was probably in 2016 when I was really pushing myself super hard and going hundred percent on league. Mm -hmm. Do you have any regrets from doing that? Like missing out on, it sounds like pretty close to like three years that you were just wholeheartedly in there. And that's a lot of time to miss out on things. And if you look at like pro players, they obviously start very young. It's normally like, 15, 16 are the ages that I commonly see where they start to like gung ho all in on uh, a video game and they tend to miss out on aspects, but you were a little bit older when you did that. Did you, do you feel like you have regrets of things that you missed out on? I don't think I, I don't think I missed out on a ton. My, my interests tend to kind of wax and wane a little bit and it, it just really depends on how much time I'm willing to put into it uh, because it's, it's such a social thing for me, everything I do, like as long as I'm getting that fulfillment out of something, I don't particularly mind. Um, in, in recent years, I definitely started picking up a lot more hobbies as I've gotten settled in Germany. Like, uh, some of like the homesickness that I get every now and again, like I kind of sate by like watching a lot of American sports, like NFL. Uh, I, I read a lot of comic books now, which I didn't do for a long time. Um, something I did like a little bit as a kid and, uh, yeah, like a lot of hobbies that I dropped off like way before riot and esports and everything. I just started kind of like rediscovering in the last couple of years. Um, and that sort of like filled a bit of a gap, but it took me, I think it just took me a while to realize that I did have that gap or, or, you know, maybe I just, I, I wasn't getting as much out of just going all in on, on League of Legends after a while. And I just wanted to start doing different stuff. So I wouldn't say I have any regrets, but I do think it took me a little while to realize that I probably should, you know, diversify my interests a little bit. And so I imagine that during that time, you probably didn't have like any time for relationships. Um, it sounds like that. Um, relationships are a really weird issue in esports, and it really bothers me because people are, always say that like it's not doable. And I don't agree at all with that. Uh, I think it's very unhealthy, that thought process, to anyone who thinks that. I'm just throwing healthy yeah, relationships. I, I, never, I don't know if it's a meme. I, like, that's that I don't was know. The whole, like, girlfriends are ruining the LCS thing. And I'm I like, don't think it was. I want to laugh at this. I want to laugh at this, but I feel like people take it seriously. Um, people do. Yeah, it, it's, that's, that's BS. Like, to be honest, it's, it's not about relationships. It's about, it's about having, like, the time and yeah. the understanding between you and the other person to, to commit to being able to split that in a way like esports demands a lot of your time and attention as for the reasons you mentioned before, but having somebody that can understand that, you know, there's, there's no reason you can't make things work. Um, so yeah, like that's, that's pretty much all I got on that one. So, okay. yeah. So you're moving through, um, it was obviously a, a major passion in your life. And then after two to three years, something started to kind of change. It sounds like where you weren't as passionate, uh, about what you were doing, what caused that kind of like change? Because obviously leading up to today's circumstances um, kind of makes an explanation that maybe it was a slow path. What was the big change for you? Uh, well, I think I think for a long time, the drive that I had was to kind of like do the biggest and best like shows I could, right? Just be on the biggest desk and rock it as much as possible. Um, my highlights definitely came in 2016 when I got to do Worlds, when I got to do MSI, especially that game that everyone always talks about with Kobe. Uh, where he he pretty much outplayed by played me. I'll I'll admit that he did. Uh, 
I think after that, things slowed down a little bit. And I don't know if it was if it was me or it was just Riot was changing direction a little bit. Uh, but I definitely noticed I was I was getting some less opportunities. Mm -hmm. And it kind of fed a little bit into itself. And, and I think I kind of stopped growing as much because of that. Like I was, I had been pushing myself and I, I wasn't in my mind getting rewarded as much. And I think I like kind of let myself kind of relax a little bit more. And you know, I'm not really sure what came first, chicken or the egg, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely wasn't as passionate about the game as I had been. And you know, I think it's fairly natural after several years of doing something to kind of lose a little bit of interest in it. Uh, but I really wanted to, I wanted to push and I wanted to kind of keep driving towards doing the best I could on the desk. I just wasn't really finding a lot of success outside of that. Like I tried my hand at a handful of content. I remember, you know, we have, we have, uh, the euphoria podcast, but not a lot of people remember prior to that. I actually had done a, a, like a short form podcast where I interviewed players and that was cool. It just, it didn't reach a lot of ears. It wasn't a huge like commercial success. Right. So after several like ventures similar to that, I just, I wasn't really having a whole lot of success doing things that weren't casting or interviewing. <laughs> and I don't know, maybe I started getting some doubts about my own abilities. Uh, maybe Riot started doubting my ability to do things uh, to that level. So I definitely lost a little bit of passion and lost some self-confidence there. And I think that's when I started thinking, well, look, I've done League for three, four years, however long it's been. I should look at some other games because no matter what, I'm going to want to see what else is out there for me. <laughs> Riot is an awesome place to work as long as you love doing League of Legends, but there's not a lot of opportunities to really do other things, to really branch out. You, you've got to do what's going to help out Riot and you've got to work on League stuff primarily. There's, there's, no, there's no real opportunity to go anywhere else. So I started kind of exploring those options really at the end of 2017. And it took about a year of planning for me to kind of make the move that I made today. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with how things turned out overall. Mm -hmm. So we mentioned stress a little bit earlier and he left. Did he, did like his leaving, because I know that he was someone who you worked with a lot and he sounded like he was kind of important to your life. Does his leaving kind of help? Did you think back to that and think that maybe I should do this? It definitely influenced me a little bit there. Um, when, when he left, I, you know, he was one of the people I really enjoyed working with from a, from like a co cast or co-cast perspective um, because we just kind of got each other. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I think it's really, it's really underrated how important a good duo is. And I think the style that was really prevalent in Europe, uh, especially in the last couple of years, was a lot more like hard hitting analysis, like let's dive deep into the specifics and the micro. And so this is, this is the kind of thing that was like popularized by Crepo, for instance, and, and he was really, really good at it. Uh, but that's, it's not a style that I was really ever good at playing with because I'm not super analytical. I'm, I'm very much like hype man, like yells all the time, like, like flourishy. You know, you can look at it. Oh, hang on, you cut out again. Hello. I'm still with you. Yeah, there you go. Am I still with you? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So I always thought of myself more as like a like a Rivington type of caster. That's a lot of the statements are flowery. Um, I'm kind of like getting you excited to kind of ride that energy roller coaster with me. And I guess you could say like Captain Flowers is a similar style as well. I think he has his variations and stuff. Um, but one of the one of the struggles I always had was was working with those really hard analytical casters uh, that were like Crepo, that are like Vettius, for instance, mm -hmm. um, because my style is, is a lot more like showmany, and, and they want to do more more hard analysis. Stress was really easy to work with in that regard because he would kind of mold his own style to whatever you wanted to do. Uh, in the same way that Deficio would do it, actually, Deficio is really easy to work with for everyone because he can kind of fit around any style, any type of caster. And I think this is what made him such a success. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that that was one of the big struggles I had working with some of the color casters on the EU side and working within that, that EU centric style. I don't know if I would have been more or less successful had I gone to like NALCS for instance. Um, but you know, it's always an interesting thought experiment. That's actually what I was going to ask you next. Do you wish that you would have? Because you, it sounded like you were kind of given an option at one point. And I say kind of because the stuff that I have read, it sounds like it might have been more hard hitting towards EU. But because EU obviously needed people at the time. But were you given an option between NA and EU? Well, when I interviewed, I actually thought I was interviewing for EU. But this was right before Joe and D-Man left. And I think Ryan knew that was happening. So uh, I got a call when I got the offer. I got the call and they just said, good news bad news. I'm like, what's the bad news? We don't want you on NALCS. I was like, crap. Okay, what's the good news? Want to move to Germany? 
<laughs> so okay. I, yeah, I mean, it was, it was definitely a need. Um, I, I pursued going to NA at one point, um, but that was about the time they had picked up flowers and there wasn't really a lot of need at the moment. So uh, it just, it never seemed to be the right time. Mm-hmm. And I think that ultimately I probably would have done better with my brand had I made a transition, but I don't regret the time I spent in Europe. Like I, I have a lot of really passionate fans over there and they're all like really incredible people. And I wouldn't have built that up had I made the move. Um, so I, you know, as always, it was kind of like a, a big conflicting thing. Like I thought maybe it'd be better for my career to do this or the other thing, but I always appreciated that there were people that were, that loved hearing what I had to offer. And I know that it was somewhat unique in the European ecosystem. Um, it may not have been, you know, the most popular style of casting, but it was something that I was pretty happy that I had on my own. Mm-hmm. So looking at this and moving forward and you're starting to feel, were you starting to feel burnt out? Were you starting to get tired of working at right? What was it that made the decision like, cause I imagine that's a terrifying decision being a free agent myself, that moment where you're like, do, do I go into self-employed or unemployed, whatever you want to call it, free agency. Unemployed, man. That's, yeah, fun that's, employed. The, that's the best one. Fun employed. Uh, that must, that's a, that's a terrifying thought to be like, is this going to be, am I going to give stability up for this new adventure? What was the thought process that led you to that? Well, I, I tend to overanalyze like when I'm making big decisions like this. So I definitely went back and forth on it for a long time. I mentioned I'd been planning or thinking about it at least back to like the end of last year. Um, and I think I just, I just came to the realization that I wasn't going to be able to grow a lot more at Riot. And I don't think that, that Riot believed I could grow a lot for, further either. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, look, you know, I can stay here and it's going to be fine. And I'm still going to be a, a great caster here. But I'm just going to slowly fade out if I don't make a change at some point. So, you know, I, I basically just thought, well, look, the only way forward, if I want to push myself in esports, the only way forward is to move. And it, it sucks to kind of realize that because I was like, well, look, that means I got to leave. I got to do this. I got to go somewhere else. But uh, at the same time, I was excited to take on something new. And I obviously, I have some stuff in the future that I, I don't want to announce just yet. Um, but I, I have guess. some things on the horizon that I'm, that I'm really excited about. And that having those opportunities start coming my way was, was I think, the tipping point that made me realize I can do this. I can, I can make this move as, as scary as it is. Okay. So you're not going to tell us what those things are? Not yet, um, but you'll you'll start finding out in the next couple of days. So so keep a weather eye on the horizon. Okay. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a prediction out now. You have not told me, but I'm just gonna throw a guess out. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that it involves Blizzard. That's that's the guess. We'll see. Well, that's the guess I'm throwing. You have to you have to watch to find out. I, I know I will I will, but that's my guess right now is Blizzard. Uh, uh, so looking at kind of transitioning out of. Uh, league. One of the things that I noticed, like kind of looking back at you, is you are uh, very politically outspoken. You definitely speak up on issues that you <laughs> believe in, um, that you full heartedly like agree with or disagree with, and I think that's a, a beautiful thing that not a lot of people are willing to do because they are scared of the PR backlash that comes with that. Sometimes, what are your thoughts on that? Like, what makes you um, say that I'm willing to I'm willing hmm. to do this, even if there's a chance it could be negative? I guess when it comes down to it, like, especially the political issues that, you know, are a lot of the ones that I'm talking about are U.S. based and the U.S. is kind of crazy right now uh, and has been for the last several years. I'd say it it, it just gets to a point where even if I wasn't a big media personality or presence, I'd want to be talking about this because it's, it's important to speak out for what you believe in. And there's a way to do it that doesn't disparage people and if you if you feel alienated by someone just saying something political in general then well personally i think that's kind of an insecurity Mm -hmm. and i i don't really i don't really think that i should mute myself just because someone only wants to hear my opinions on esports uh and the flip side of it is because i have a large following or at least you know a sizable following on on twitter and some other platforms i feel like it's my responsibility to speak up about things that i believe in and to spread awareness this can come down to like, if there's like, there was that, there was a horrific shooting at Thousand yeah. Oaks uh, today. Like, you know, I, I took a little bit of time out of my announcement to, to retweet a thing from, um, if you're familiar with game theorists, uh, Matt Pat, um, I follow him a lot and he, he tweeted about it. 
And I just retweeted that and just said, Hey, look, this is, this is super important. Keep, you know, something's got to change. This is not okay. And then a lot of links to, Hey, if you want to be a blood donor here, like, you know, just, just trying to help out where I can. Um, and I wouldn't say like I do, you know, I, I don't do a ton. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not standing like at a, at a, at a protest like 24 seven. I mean, I'm, I'm overseas, but at the same time, there's stuff I can do more than I'm doing, but I do think it's important to speak out whenever it's possible, especially for people who have a large enough following to, to spread visibility reasonably. So that belief is what drives me to, to speak out when I can, and people might not always be happy about that. And <laughs> that's, that's their prerogative. If they don't want to follow me, they don't have to. Mm-hmm. So looking at, that ability to speak out and now that you are no longer with riot because if you were still with riot i wouldn't even bother asking these questions um what do you think about the situation involving riot right now because so far there is uh there is an article been released that there is a lawsuit coming forward um it sounds like the na region so i don't know if the eu region is any better um what do you feel about the like the lawsuit and the situations that have been kind of talked about going on with uh Riot, but also kind of like in esports in general, you hear stories a lot of the time going on. In Overwatch, we recently had an issue uh, with different malpractice. Um, what do you think about uh, these types of issues? Well, there's there's a lot to unpack there. Um, with the the Overwatch stuff, I'm I'm not 100 percent familiar the exact nature of all that. But uh, from the the Riot perspective, obviously, like this is a pretty touchy subject. Um, I think. Well, first off, I'll, I'll, I'll preface this by saying this isn't to defend Riot or recuse yeah. them from anything. But I think this is a problem that is in tech and internet culture in general. Like, there is, there is heaps of, 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 of harassment and, and sexist behavior that goes on online and in person in, in a lot of different corporate environments. And that sucks. I think it's just it's a problem with our society in general. And I think it's just becoming more spotlighted. I don't think it's necessarily getting worse. I have to hope it's not getting worse. Um, but with regards to the Riot stuff specifically, there's a lot of really, really good people that work at Riot, and this like sucks massively for them that this is this kind of thing is is kind of overhanging a lot of the good things that they do. And I know there are a lot of people there that are that are working to make this right. A lot of people that weren't even there when a lot of these these incidences were happening. Um, I can say that I, I personally never experienced or witnessed this stuff. I've had people tell me things secondhand and of course I believe them because I have no reason to otherwise. Um, but it's obviously not my place to kind of like speak out unless those people want me to. Yeah. So it's always like a really tough kind of situation. And like, I, I just hope that whatever, whatever happens, the resolution, the resolution of all of this is that that environment becomes a lot friendlier for people to work in. Mm-hmm. And there, there isn't this like fear that if you, if something happens, you can't talk to someone and, and get that actually sorted. Um, I, I don't really have much much else to offer on that's it, fine. but uh, yeah, obviously it's it's a sucky situation that's been playing out for a while, and I just I hope it gets wrapped up with the, you know, with a, a good move forward and, and the culture changes. Mm-hmm. So looking at kind of like uh, different <laughs> malpractices or things that uh, don't work out, I know that Monty has come out and said before that Riot doesn't treat their their casters well enough. Um, he had a very vocal opinion about that. Um, you're now yeah, going, <laughs> you're, he's not the only one. There are other people as well. He's the big one. Uh, just cause I know I'm, I'm, I don't know if I disagree or agree really cause I don't know the situation, but now that you're looking at going to be a freelancer, I must imagine that to some semblance, you, you, you must agree at least a little bit, not maybe fully with this situation. But I also noticed that shocks today also announced that she is going to be a freelance, but she's also going to still be working with riot. So how, how much of that situation is true? Do you think that casters aren't treated fairly in the riot scene? Do you, what do you think about that? I, I mean, fairly is like, that's, that's like a, that's true. Business, say beloved, business beloved is not fair. Right? We should, let's, 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 let's put it this way. Um, when you work at riot as a shout caster, or at least the, the business model that has been going on for a while, um, has been, you know, you're, you're exclusive. You sign on to, to be like a face and, and part of the riot branding and you get a lot of benefits and you get a lot of restraints with that. Um, oh, you know, we used to joke about the caster cage and I think that was, that was kind of like, it was a meme, but like the metaphor that I always like to explain to people was the caster cage is very real. It is gilded and stuffed with really nice pillows. They always took care of us very well financially. Like that, that I think is the big thing that I want to get out of the way is like, right. Right. Compensated me very fairly. 
for what I did and for my exclusivity. That being said, it was still frustrating at times to have that exclusivity. There were um, a lot of things I wish I had been able to do or push for while I was still at Riot uh, that I wasn't able to do. Um, for instance, my, my Twitch stream, um, I was never able to monetize it. And I was kind of disincentivized to really push it along. Now, that being said, I could have still built an audience. Um, and this is what I'm looking to do more of now that I'm now that I'm freelance. Uh, but I wasn't able to really collect on that. Now I know a lot of people think, oh wait, riders can always do that because Crepo did. Well, that wasn't that was a special thing that he got in his contract. I could have negotiated that. Yeah. Um, but I I definitely didn't have as so much pull as him, and I never really instigated that because it was never worth it at the time, whatever I would have had to give up in order to get that. So the exclusivity on a lot of things was definitely challenging, but I never felt like I was unfairly treated because I had implicitly accepted that um, from the beginning. So it's definitely a big part in why I wanted to go freelance mm -hmm. because I value that, that freedom over the stability that Riot offered uh, at this point in my career. But, you know, it's, it's just all about trade-offs. Like, if you're willing to accept that trade-off, then it's okay. If you're not, then it's not. Mm -hmm. I, shouldn't have, I shouldn't have used fair, because business is never really about fair. It's about contracts yeah. and what you decide. So that was poor wording on my part. It's okay. Everybody falls into the trap sometimes, Blake. Yeah. So looking at esports, I think a lot of times it's kind of put on a pedestal. And sometimes you see moments where it's there's really dark moments what are some of the, the the negatives that people never really get to see about esports because a lot of times everyone involved in esports whether it's uh pr teams for 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 teams for riot they're always trying to push the best image but you never really get a true sense of what goes on behind the scenes whether that's uh like player neglect um stuff like that so what are some of the things that you know about the scene that no one really wants to talk about that probably should be addressed that you would like to see changed Ooh, huh. That's a tough one. Um, I'm trying to think back to like a lot of specifics and a lot of things that I, that I, I probably can and should, cannot and shouldn't talk about anyways. Mm -hmm. Um, but overall, are you talking specifically relating to league or just like esports as a whole? We can do league and esports. Okay. Um, I would say the biggest problem that I experienced, and I think it's gotten a lot better over time is is team infrastructure kind of being built out to support and accommodate the players in in proper ways um this is gonna this is probably gonna be somewhat controversial because i think like a lot of people have a very simplistic opinion of it uh i think player unions or something similar to it should absolutely be a thing mm -hmm. um across all esports as well and i know like there are steps being taken towards that in some ways but the way esports works especially within like environments like 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 Riot and also Blizzard is it, it tends to be, it, the, the control is fairly favored by the publisher. I, I single them out not to be mean and not to say yeah. they're evil, but because they their business model is very much, we want to run the league uh, from the top down. And and that model means there is a, a lot of power on one side of the, on one side of the equation. Um, I think at some point, what I would really like to see, and I don't, I don't know how this would happen because it, it, it requires a lot of like seeding of the power and a lot more like monetary viability uh, to come into play for like a third party. I would love to see like a, like an organization, like a, like an NFL or a FIFA, maybe FIFA is a bad example because of corruption, but, um, like, like a third party organization that manages respective leagues within esports, mm -hmm. And also in addition to that one that helps manage player, player contracts and things like that, because, well, I think the publishers do try to look out for the players insofar as it, as it doesn't explicitly screw them over overall they're you know businesses are always going to be looking out for their own interests on the top of it um you know it's it's not it's not like they're evil it's just that you, you can't expect 100 percent altruism because the goal at the end of the day of a company is to make more money is to to progress their business and i don't think there's like anything wrong with that at all it's just that there's a bit of a vacuum when it comes to trying to trying to help out the players and the same thing, I guess you could say for talent too. Like, I mean, you now have unions or sorry, you now have or, uh, agencies and stuff for, for players, for talent, things like that, that when I was starting shoutcasting, those kind of things were unheard of. They didn't really exist as far as I was aware. Maybe I was sleeping under a rock or something, but um, as far as I was aware, that just, that just didn't exist. So as this more legitimacy kind of keeps on going uh, and, and esports in general keep getting recognized, you're going to see a lot more of this stuff cropping up. It's, probably just going to still experience some growing pains over time. And 
eventually we'll see a lot more of that power being balanced out between all of the parties that get involved in, in these esports leagues and tournaments. Do you think a player's union or uh, a union for some is actually viable considering that the IP belongs to the game publisher? Because when I when I think about player's union, I think about uh, the NA LCS and their player's union. And from what it sounds like, it doesn't sound like they very much have power. And the way that the current system is set up is everyone is functionally a mercenary that fights for each other's jobs. So there's never going to be a moment in my eyes, where I could see someone being altruistic enough where they're willing to strike, which is the only bargaining power that they would have, for another person. And because the IP power goes to the, the publisher, is it even a feasible thing? Because when I hear it, I think of the publisher yeah. should functionally act as the players' union. That might be the best situation, is that they actually pull the players underneath them and look out for the players. I don't know if it's as plausible or more plausible but when i hear that that sounds like a better solution because they already control everything about the game yeah i think that's that's the troubling thing that's why i talk about like balance of power because the company owns the ip this is this is one of the biggest differences between esports and traditional sports mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. the publisher owns the rights to the game itself which just there's no analog for it so maybe the solution is that they need to act as the player as the players union as well but what if the conflict is with the publisher themselves like that's that's where things start to get a little muddy and that's why i say i don't think there's an easy way forward on this no. um to to kind of lay out the the vision that i was talking about um but uh, i guess when i what i was talking about there was it was much more of like like how to sort of move things into the future as opposed to like re resolve like horror stories that are happening yeah. now i just there's a lot of there's a lot of things that definitely fly under the radar, and there's a lot of challenges to to esports kind of being more mainstream, legitimate. And I think the more coverage, the more money that flows into it, the better it's going to get. It's just how do you untangle a lot of the power structures in place? That's a big challenge, and I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, I think it's a very very terrifying thing sometimes to think about because re really it's either the the teams the best for what's the teams or what's best for the publisher. A lot of times it feels like the player is a third party that is not necessarily what's best for the players because it's really the business yeah. agreement between teams and the publisher. So yeah. it's, Sometimes it's, it can be flipped, though, too. Sometimes the players have way more power than the teams do, and that, that can also be troubling. Yeah, I, I fully agree that that would be uh, definitely troubling. So on a lighter topic, because I mentioned this Netflix, uh, you are a My Little Pony fan. Yeah, uh, I haven't watched it for God, like three or four years, but uh, it was definitely a it was definitely a fun show to watch while I was really pursuing the esports dream because mm -hmm. it's it's very aspirational. It's mm -hmm. it's you know it's like moral escapism. It was a lot of fun. One of my roommates at the time actually turned me onto it, and at first I was kind of like, "Ew, why would I do that?" Like everybody else on the internet, and then I was like, "Actually, it's pretty it's a pretty good show." Okay. Well, you mentioned uh, like <laughs> uh, anime, which. Uh, for us, being younger, anime was not a cool thing. Like today, anime is significantly cooler. Like people are well, like in our, oh. in our circle, especially. Yeah. Yeah, uh, in our circles, especially. But I remember growing up that that was not something that you really talked about either. And I didn't really even get into anime because of that, because I already had picked on enough. So what kind of made you like? Were you someone who was okay talking about these things and expressing these things that you love, or was that something that you hid? I think that one especially was always a little was always a little like off to some people because there are certain there are certain like communities that I think give give like people who are interested in the same stuff like a bit of a bad rap mm -hmm. and you know this was always a challenge for me like if I was interested in something that wasn't you know cool uh, or people thought was weird like I would always have to be a little bit guarded before I like actually told the people that hey this is something I'm into if they even cared like if they don't care then it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Um but like with anime growing up like I only had a handful of friends I would I would talk to about it because those were the only ones that knew that I cared about it uh and and we would like share that stuff. But when it came to something like My Little Pony and I was already older, I was already in my mid 20s, like I was like screw it, I'm a brony, I'm going to be happy about this. I I don't, you know, I'm not like I'm one of those like casual fans mm -hmm. where like I'll watch it and like, you know, like maybe comment on an episode, but I'm not like writing fan fiction or nothing. Like I don't really get too deep into it. Um, but uh, to combine the, 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 the other, the other interests, there was, there's this great like subreddit, which was like, I think it was called like my little alcoholic or something where like people would just like talk about <laughs> what beer they enjoyed while they were watching the show. And I was a, I was a contributor on that for a couple of weeks. And I don't, I don't encourage alcoholism by the way. It was just a pun. Yes, um, I don't either, or really so. a really poorly tasted taste name, but um, yeah, like it, it's it was it was a fun thing, and I think when when I was like kind of a little bit low on self confidence, and 
uh, trying to really like keep my drive to, to do what I was doing. Um, cause it was very scary to make that transition in the first place. It was, it was something that kind of kept me sane. It was like the same reason, like when I first left the job, I was watching, like I, I was, you know, the, the movie office space. I watched that like three or four times a week when I first left the job. Cause I wanted to feel like it wasn't like some massive mistake that was going to ruin my life. And you know, that movie is about a guy leaving a job he hates. So, uh, I think people find meaning in the medium that they, that they enjoy. And that was when I was, when I was really pushing myself in esports and needed, needed a little extra motivation and uh, just kind of like pleasant escapism. I would watch stuff like My Little Pony and it helped. And that is a good ending, I think, for this show. I think I always like to end on happy endings. And so I kind of, kind of queued that one up. Um, do you have any last things that you want to say before uh, we get out of here? Uh, yeah, for everybody that's watched me the last four years, thank you so much for being a part of my journey on the European LCS. And definitely keep your eyes peeled for some announcements in the next couple of days. I've got some got some cool stuff to share with y'all. And uh, I guess shout out to you, Blake, for, uh, for interviewing me. This is my first uh, post-ride interview. Yes, thank you so much, guys. Have a wonderful day. Hey, guys. I want to thank you for making it to the end of this video. I know that this content is a longer format specifically to showcase a more emotional side of people involved in esports. I think it's really important that we stay empathetic and show support to all of my guests that are willing to come onto the show. Sometimes they share some very heartfelt things that they've never shared with anyone else before. I think it's important that they understand that we support them and that this is a safe experience to do. This will show others that coming on the show is something that they can also do in order to share with all of us so we better understand esports as a whole and the people who are involved in it. Finally, if you enjoy this content as much as I do making it, I would encourage you to check out my Patreon that I have created. This will help you to support equipment upgrades, future content, exclusive content, and my general ability to drink an overabundant amount of coffee. And make sure to include some tiers that allow you to support this channel and give rewards anywhere from receiving my content early to being able to know the guests early and submit questions for exclusive videos. So I hope you check it out. I hope you have a wonderful day.